In this video, we want to turn our attention to frugal innovation. In other words, innovation which is cheaper and at the same time maintaining standards and maintaining the quality of the product, but done more efficiently, done more frugally. In other words, we, we use less resources and it perhaps takes less time and less effort to produce the innovation. And this would make it accessible to a wider population. Perhaps poorer people could afford the product. So it's a way of looking at sophisticated products and seeing if they can be delivered to poorer sections of the population. And this is a very important topic because throughout the world we know there are a lot of areas that are short of resources and the people are living under stressful conditions to say the least. And frugal technology and frugal innovation, frugal changes, may make products accessible to those people that would perhaps otherwise not be available. So let's look at some of the ideas associated with frugal technology and see how it how it can work. The concept of frugal innovation opens up a new dimension uh, for innovation. In a sense, classically, when we think of innovation, we think of newness, we think of modernity, we think of modern products, we think of uh, technology, we think of uh, labour-saving devices and uh, more fashionable devices. Products have been innovated. But we can also think of innovation as cost-saving, as being more efficient, as being more helpful and more accessible. So it's this type of concept that underpins this whole area of what's known as frugal innovation. Frugal innovation helps new business or develops new business models and helps business to reflect and think about the extensions of the market into poorer, poorer areas, poorer parts of the world, and seeing what modifications to products are needed in order to make those products accessible in those areas. So it looks at developing new business models, new ways of working, new ways of designing products and of delivering products, but it does it all within um, constrained resources, limited resources, and it needs to restructure the value chain to develop the new products and services to meet the new market conditions. So it's a total revamp of the business model. Generally speaking, in the West, we're, we consider business models related to uh, profitability, expansion, uh, survival, growth. These are words we use in the context of the business model. Perhaps words which would include accessibility for poorer parts of the world. These are not what we expect to see in uh, in, in the business policy of an organisation. But perhaps it should be there. That's the point. And if organisations, instead of making disposable products which are wasteful on the Earth's resources, were to make products which could be recycled and which could be reused and would have greater longevity as a, as a consequence, they would last longer, then they could perhaps become more accessible and more useful in many parts of the world. So we're talking here about a totally different way of doing business, targeting poorer parts of the world and delivering products that are affordable within those markets and ones which will make a significant improvement to the standard of living for those people living there. So it's a question of designing products which are designed efficiently, that are robust, strong, good quality, but perhaps made out of materials which are 
uh, more available, more readily available and cheaper. Perhaps designed in ways which do not require uh, a lot of investment in R&D or in uh, assembly or in shipping. Perhaps done more efficiently so that poorer parts of the world can get access to products that they can genuinely use. The process involves limiting resources, cutting costs to produce the same or similar products that are sustainable, affordable and high quality. There's no point in, in making products and send, sending those to poor countries if those products are, are not reliable, if they're, they're going to break easily. Uh, if they've just been put together very quickly because they've been sold cheaply. That's not helping anyone. It's not helping the planet. It's not helping the poor people. So it's a question of designing products and delivering products <coughs> that are uh, sustainable, that they're going to last. They're also affordable. The people in those countries have to be able to purchase those products. There's no point in bringing products to the countries and showing the products to the people and then saying, well, it's a nice product, but you can't afford it. Just look at it and go away. That's no good. So it needs to be high quality. It needs to be good quality. It's going to last. It's sustainable and it's affordable. Some writers think that we are too accustomed to disposing of, of items. Uh, we're too accustomed to uh, just the first fix is a non-fix. The first fix is to dispose of the item. If, um, if we have a washing machine and the washing machine breaks down, sometimes we don't even try to get it fixed. Uh, we dispose of it, buy a new one. If a microwave breaks down, we buy a new one. We, we don't get it fixed. We are living in a disposable society, a lot of people. But the resources of the earth cannot sustain that. And certainly with population pressure, it can't sustain it. So moving towards innovations which are uh, more affordable, more durable, perhaps that is a way forward and that the the effort should now go into designing products and delivering products that are accessible to wider sections of the world's population products and services are developed mainly for developing countries where resources are scarce and the majority of customers live in poverty but those people still need communications. They need to be able to find solutions to problems. It could be medical. They may have an illness and they want to know what are the symptoms and what can they do to try and ameliorate the problem or even solve the problem. So they need access to information. They need uh, they need a lot of the resources that are currently available in privileged countries, but they can't afford it. So frugal technology suggests, well, why not make essentially the same products, but try to make them more efficiently. They may not have the same style. They may not have exactly the same functionality, but they do essentially the same thing and make those products available in those poorer countries. The obvious example here, uh, the one I'm not mentioning, is Galton College. We are producing educational material, collating educational material, and putting together a college using existing technologies. These are technologies with which we are all familiar. Facebook, Twitter, online streaming, YouTube. So Galton College did not invent those things. They kindly said to the inventors, thank you very much, we can use these for education. 
and thereby we can hold the fees that students have to pay, we can hold those fees down, down very low, to widen the access that people have to this type of education. And Gaunton College have further schemes in the pipeline to widen it even further at a later stage. Frugal innovation forces change in a new way of thinking. Often the purpose is for social and welfare missions. It's, it's a new way of thinking. Instead of engaging in the throwaway mentality and, and, and engaging in all of, all of that involves, buying something, using it for a while, disposing of it, putting it in the bin, uh, sending it to a, a, a landfill site where it's going to pollute the earth for hundreds of years, or even worse still, throw it into the ocean. Instead of doing that, recycling, making the thing more efficient so it'll last longer, and not having a constant race to try and keep up with each other to have the latest gadget. Instead of that, be comfortable with what we've got. It works. And let the companies, or encourage the companies, to design products that are suitable for poorer people and make them affordable for poorer people so that they too can get access to information and uh, communications channels and so on. Business must respond to challenges such as limited resources, whether financial, material or institutional, to develop new methods which turn constraints into advantages. There is, in the background here, uh, a suggestion that, in fact, this could be quite profitable for business. There are a lot of people living in poor countries. And instead of making a lot of money out of each sale, if the companies just made a small amount and made the products available, perhaps a redesigned product, so there's, there's no uh, cross-selling between borders, that, that somebody doesn't import into one country and export it on to a, a high-cost country and sell it at a profit. So there's no reselling between centres. There is what economists call um, price discrimination. But if the companies can make the product suitable for that market and make a very small amount of profit, there are such a lot of sales, it could still be very profitable in total. So the people get access to a technology, to a product, to some addition to their, to their lives that will make their lives better and easier. <clears throat> and in return, the company makes a profit. And it's all done because the company is trying to be efficient. They're trying to be frugal in the use of the resources they put into the product whilst making a, a good quality product they're being frugal, they're, they're using resources efficiently, they're using their skills and their abilities efficiently and providing a service and providing a product that those people want. Frugal innovations that are successful result in lower costs. They also result in improved quality uh, and this can be uh, made available at a larger scale. So frugal innovations reduce the cost. They cut out the frills. They find different ways of making products, more efficient ways, using different resources. And they try to build products which are more durable, better quality. So in a sense, everybody's a winner. Frugal innovation is a good idea. The company wins because the company makes a profit, albeit a smaller profit out of each sale, but perhaps a profit nonetheless. So the company makes a profit. The, the buyer gets a product which is durable, long-lasting, and performs well. And planet Earth wins as well. 
because we have less disposable products. We have less waste. We're using the resources of the planet more efficiently. Through processes um, of product re-engineering and reinventing high value products and lower consumer prices, products can be made affordable for consumers um, at the, the base of the pyramid. Now I'll talk about the pyramid in a second. So the, what we're really talking about here, poor consumers. But if we take a product and re-engineer it, in other words, we take any product, uh, a vacuum cleaner or a washing machine or a, a mobile phone or whatever it is, and we open it up and look inside and think, can we do this differently and a bit cheaper? Perhaps we have to increase the size of it slightly, but so be it. If we increase the, the size slightly, we can now buy cheaper components and put them in. But these components have been around a long time. They're durable. They're they're going to last. Let's put those in. So now we're making products which are targeting that particular country. They're not the high-end fashionable products. These are functional products. But they deliver what the people want, which is communications. They might deliver internet. And through there, they can get knowledge about medicines and education and news and they're they're now participating in the global economy so it's re-engineering it's making the same product but making it in a sense a second time the second time looking for efficiencies looking for better ways of, of making it now i talk about this pyramid let's let's talk a bit about that the economic base of the pyramid so Let's talk about, uh, for a start, let's talk about the top of the pyramid. Most companies focus on the top of the pyramid. These are the mature markets. This is Western Europe and North America and Singapore and parts of China, Shanghai and so on, Tokyo, uh, the richer parts of the world. So products are aimed at those parts of the world because there is purchasing power there. The consumers can afford. They can afford to buy an iPhone, uh, which is, to many people on, on, the, on the planet, phenomenally expensive. They can afford to buy a Samsung. They can afford to buy a luxury car. They can afford to buy, and so on. This is the top of the pyramid. Mature markets, rich consumers, who have access to to those products and because they've got access to the products the producers have no real incentive to cut corners to look for efficiencies or big efficiencies they they simply put the best together put it into a product and sell it at a profit in the middle of the pyramid we have the emerging markets these are the markets that are coming out from poverty into some sort of industrialization stroke development. Parts of India, for example, parts of Africa. Uh, these are the emerging markets. And in there, there are going to, there's going to be some people who can afford the top end products. These will be the, the managerial classes. These will be the, the, the people who are educated and hold down responsible and top-in jobs within those uh, types of economy. But there will be a lot of people in the, in the same economies who are very poor and who can't afford. So in the emerging markets, there is going to be a demand for the, if you like, the non-frugal innovations and changes and there's also going to be a demand for the frugal innovations and changes the frugal ones the the cut down versions the cheaper versions the ones which are affordable to those people so the middle 
uh, part of the pyramid, the emerging markets, is made up from the two sets. And then we get to the base of the pyramid, which is the vast majority of mankind. And this is where frugal technology is essential. These are the survival markets where people are just living day to day, trying to survive. But they need to break out of that. They need help to break out of it. And access to any technologies or any uh, products that help them is to be welcomed. But companies will not supply those products unless it's profitable to do so. They may do it for a limited time, but then they'll run out of resources and uh, focus in on their traditional markets, which are the mature markets of the West or the emerging markets or, or that section of the emerging markets that can afford their products. But in the, in the survival markets, they will withdraw from their survival markets because people can't afford their products. But if the companies were to re-engineer their products, and if that was possible, it may not always be possible, but if it was, then they could uh, insert different components, durable components, good quality components, but cheaper, redesign the, the product itself so that it was, again, more durable. Uh, it may not look as fancy or as, as fashionable, but it does the job and it it would make an enormous change and contribution to the lives of those poor people. So that's where frugal innovation really fits, full-blooded, at the base of the pyramid. The majority of companies aim to satisfy the top and the middle pyramids, as I said earlier, where there are there is high purchasing power. And this is the traditional top-down approach. Top-down, starting at the top of the pyramid with the, the affluent uh, customers, moving their way down to the, the very poor. As new innovations enter the market, previous or older in innovations then cascade through the pyramid to the base of the pyramid. So it's, it's quite common, for example, to see people in the top of the at the top of the pyramid the rich people having smart televisions big uh, screens very high quality resolution pictures and and then if we at the same time go to the bottom of the pyramid we may see people looking at very poor quality televisions older televisions ones that have come down uh, so the it cascades down, products cascade downwards to the bottom of the pyramid. But at least the products are being used, and that's a good thing. And rather than to see the products going straight, uh, straight to um, a landfill or straight out to sea to pollute the earth. But far better if the companies could re-engineer the products, as I said earlier, and make products good quality products available cheaper to the bottom part of the pyramid. Frugal innovation concentrates at the base of the pyramid and then works up the pyramid. And this is referred to the, uh, to the situation which is called bottom up. We're moving from the base of the pyramid upwards. Sometimes uh, entrepreneurs at the base of the pyramid may come up with ideas and those ideas are worth considering all the way through the pyramid and their ideas become successful all the way right up to the top. But generally speaking because the technology companies uh, have such vast reserves and uh, highly skilled personnel and highly skilled uh, uh, managers and specialist equipment they're able to design the products for the the top end of the pyramid and then let products cascade downwards 
Now, the mentions of frugal innovation. Well, frugal in, uh, innovation takes into to account the following elements. And here we're going to just insert uh, the various elements around here. For example, we start with the input costs. So frugal innovation will be concerned with the input cost. How much does it cost to make the product? Because if it's too much, simply the poor people can't afford it. It won't be adopted. And this input cost will be research and development, uh, making the product itself, servicing the product, and then scaling it up so it can be produced, opening a factory to make the product and make it available. So there are considerable costs on the input side. On the output side, we have to make sure that the product is good quality and that it can be distributed throughout the market. It must be affordable. Uh, there's no point in putting the product on the market if people cannot afford to buy it. They're just simply going to look at it and have to leave it. What's the point? So they need to have a product which is affordable. And it should also be adaptable. They should be able to use it in different ways. The more ways they can use it, the more successful the product will be in helping them. So a mobile phone is a good example. It makes phone calls, but it also accesses the internet. It also enables them to, to send emails and to view videos. and it's, it's a mini computer. But it should also have performance. Um, it should deliver the service in a reasonable time span. It's not fair that they should have to wait for a long time. Now, we can't say that mobile phones are entirely responsible for that. It would be the network that is responsible and part and parcel of delivering uh, a good service in terms of mobile uh, telephony is to have a good uh, Wi-Fi system. There are examples of frugal innovation that we can think of. Um, Be Bound, for example. Uh, provides developing countries where there is no bandwidth with the ability to send messages using SMS. So it's quite clever. Uh, people who have mobile phones can still message, but they haven't got access to 3G or 4G or even 5G when it arrives. Pearson's, the world famous publisher and also educational institution uh, they make education available for children throughout the world poor children uh, in many centers uh, they're they're trying to find ways to deliver education cheaply and that's to be encouraged but it also means that the children have access to something that hitherto they were denied the opportunity to learn. Uh, Tata make a, a water filtration system uh, which will uh, cut down on disease and uh, on uh, the problems created by drinking poor quality water, in infected water. So it means that a lot of poor people will have access to clean drinking water. Uh, again, a simple idea. The alternative would be to have uh, a large infrastructure with um, a filtration system with pipes and taps running to different houses and different communities. Very expensive. This one, very cheap, particularly for remote communities. M-Pesa. Well, this is something we spotted on a TED Talk in 2017. It's a, a module payment system commonly used in Kenya, where 82%, according to the talk we saw, uh, where 82% of the population have mobile phones, but 
do not have bank accounts. So they're able to trade with each other using the mobile phones. Uh, they are able to, in a sense, say, I will buy from you and I will owe you this much and then I will sell to you and you will owe me this much. And there, there is a, an accounting framework and they're able to balance it. So people are able to live normal lives making transactions. They make the transactions using virtual money doing it online very sophisticated but very effective now the three pro approaches to frugal innovation well the first one is keep it simple and that's what we mean by frugal um, innovation must meet a growing need or concern it must have a purpose if the innovation is not targeted at some need, it's aimless. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to work. It must be directed at solving a problem. So to do that, they observe the customers in their natural environments to identify their challenges and their constraints. It's important to look at the, the product or service and Look at how it is, can become accessible. How, how will potential customers access this product? How will they use it? The second one is don't reinvent the wheel. If the product already exists, then it may need slight re-engineering to make it cheaper or to make it more durable or to change the design very slightly to make it more suitable but essentially the product has been invented and it's done so there's no point in trying to redo it the research and development has already been paid for it's done now it can be delivered in that society Utilize existing resources which are proven to work and adopt technologies from other industries to meet the needs of your innovation. So there's no point in just simply trying to uh, reinvent something that's going to lead to the same product ultimately. Products which exist only exist because they are successful. So if the product is successful and is there, then it can be used. I'll go back to what I said much earlier about uh, Galton College. Um, if you look at the notice board for Galton College, it's Twitter. Why is it Twitter? Because Twitter is very good and it exists. Why would Galton College want to spend a lot of money designing the college notice board when it already exists? So just use it and the money that's saved can reduce the fees that students have to pay. It's very simple. Uh, look at live tuition uh, on Galton College. It's essentially YouTube. It's apps like GoToMeeting and other apps that, that uh, it uses from time to time. But a lot of these are free. They're free to use. Uh, YouTube is free. So thanks to Google, you, uh, Galton College is able to deliver classes in real time and answer questions face to face in real time. And it's free. So why would Galton College want to spend a lot of money developing exactly that system when it's there already and made available. Therefore, Galton College can save that and cut the fees, as I said, enable the students to pay less. But the students will get a very modern um, treatment. They will deal with tutors in a very modern setting. And they will become familiar with a technology that is ubiquitous almost within the internet. So don't reinvent the wheel. Use what is available. 
and make the most of it. Think outside the box. Now that means think in a way that uh, when a product comes along, think in a way of, of using the product, which perhaps is not what the initial uh, designers had in mind. Think of different ways of using the product. So back to YouTube again. When YouTube uh, was developed, it was mostly for music and entertainment, and um, and it's good. It's it's entertaining, and there are some superb videos, amusing videos, and so on. But it can also be used for serious material like teaching, like making classes available freely to anybody. Galton College make their classes free to anybody who in the world who wants to see them. So if someone wants to look up a class on uh, the uh, on the balance sheet or on elasticity of demand, Galton College has got one for them. They've got a class and it's free. So think outside the box. It, the same product which was, I suppose, initially designed for music and entertainment and fun can also be used for a good cause to widen access to education. Do not follow the commercial route and source big factories and warehouses. Instead, think about smaller manufacturing and distribution units that keeps cost to a minimum. And it's not just the internet, you could go to making a product. Sometimes companies, when they, they, they start to design a product, almost the first thing to do is to acquire offices, large, sometimes palatial offices, very expensive offices, and look very impressive. But why? Why is that necessary? The product is going to be sold perhaps in poorer markets. Why would the company need to live or work in very palatial offices? Why not instead save the money and reduce the price of the product that the poorer people need to pay? So three approaches to frugal innovation. Keep it simple. That's what we mean by frugal. Do not reinvent the wheel. Don't do something that already exists. And think outside the box. Think of different ways of using resources. Now the conclusion. Well, the purpose of frugal innovation is to provide a need uh, to the general public based on the culture and our welfare needs in developing countries. So it's to provide uh, for a need. Oh, sorry, I left out the word for. Provide for a need to the general public based on culture and welfare needs in developing countries. So just look at the needs in many countries. Look at what the average citizen has got to spend. Look at what they need and see if it, that, that need can be facilitated, if it can be satisfied. And it could be satisfied perhaps by an existing product in a wealthier country if that product was re-engineered, changed, modified, innovated, and then delivered to the poorer country. Frugal innovation does not have to be a new invention. It could be a revised version of an existing product that can be distributed on a mass scale as an, aff an affordable alternative. So when we see people with needs in poorer countries, we don't necessarily have to make or come up with a new product to help them. The chances are the products already exist. They just need to be re-engineered reworked, made uh, accessible and designed to meet the needs of that country or of those people. And that may be a much easier task than sitting down and working out from scratch an entirely new product and then 
testing it and going through all the quality checks and production and scaling up and all of that. Instead, take what already exists, perhaps modify it if need be, reduce the cost and make it available. Countries such as India and Africa are leading the market in frugal innovation. They are incredible countries uh, doing incredible things. Well, Africa is a continent, but there are many countries within Africa doing incredible things with technology and using the technology in ways which are downright amazing. From solar panels for electricity and uh, extending the day so children uh, at night can, can do their homework. Uh, it may take them a long time to walk to school, a long time to walk back from school in a day so that they don't have an opportunity to do any homework when they get home, but the daylight has gone. But solar panels can extend the day. There are many societies which have adopted mobile phone technologies for, uh, for learning purposes, for communications, for health care. Um, there are incredible developments in agriculture, um, both in terms of weather forecasting, planting crops, uh, market information about uh, produce prices in markets, uh, all of which help farmers and help con uh, consumers. So those countries, once they've got access to the products, are proven to be very innovative themselves in the way they use the products. Frugal innovation doesn't have to be low quality or cheap, as I said. Uh, the products must be robust and of high standard to meet the constraints and conditions of a particular country. Um, for example, shoes that grow. Uh, many families in poor countries have children and they can't afford to buy the children shoes every year. But children grow up and their feet get bigger. So, a simple idea. Shoes that grow. And if you look at the shoe, it can be extended at the front. So, children have shoes for one pair of shoes may last several years. It's a very simple idea. And it's a start. The alternative is the child does not have any shoes at all. Invented for children in developing countries who cannot afford to buy shoes, the shoes are designed to be robust and to last uh, for up to five years. As children grow, the shoes adapt to different sizes. Simple idea, very simple, but a brilliant idea, because the alternative is the child goes barefoot. That's it. That's all we're going to say about frugal uh, innovation. I trust that the, uh, the video will alert you to the need for us to look critically at innovations and look at perhaps even the way we live, our lifestyles, and look at ways in which we can use innovation to adopt products suitable for markets where perhaps the people cannot afford top end. But at the same time, if given half a chance with reasonable products, they can make a significant contribution to the the quality of life of those people and indeed the whole quality of life of that country. But that's all we're going to deal with here so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.